Nelson Mandela rightly said, to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. On behalf of Chairperson Uma Chiguru Party and her committee, I, Honorary Secretary Radhika Agarwal, extend a warm welcome to our esteemed guest, Ms. Sagarika Ghosh, past Chairs, members old and new, to the session Life and Liberty at Flow. Liberty is the freedom to say or do the right thing and also the wrong thing. Liberty, when it begins to take root, is a plant of rapid growth. Liberal women have often stood up for what they believe is to be right and exercise their right to express themselves in their chosen way. In the face of social norms, cultural preferences and political correctness, we have amidst us a woman who have set the standards high push the boundaries, not just for herself, but for the coming generations, Indian journalist, columnist, and author, Sagarika Ghosh. Let us start the session by paying homage to our motherland. Please rise to the national anthem. <laughs> forward, ritualistic as it is to be, invoking the blessings of the Al Almighty, I invite our speaker, Mrs. Sagarika Ghosh, past Chase, Mrs. Monika, Mrs. Usharani Manne, Ms. Sona Chatwani, Mrs. Priyanka Ganeriwal, Mrs. Kamini Shroff, Mrs. Manjula Reddy, Mrs. Padma Raj Gopal, Mrs. Jyotsna, and Senior Vice Chair Shubra Maheshwari, to please come forward and light the lamp. Can I have one look? I invite our chairperson, Ms. Uma Chigurupati, to share her welcome address. A very good afternoon. Warm welcome to one and all. It's such a lovely feeling to see all the past chairs over here and a lot of new members who joined just recently are also here. A warm welcome to each and every one of you. I'm very happy to have Ms. Sagarika Ghos, who is the eminent journalist, columnist, and author amongst us and to handle a very powerful subject, life and liberty. I'm sure next hour or hour and a half, we are going to experience a very charged atmosphere with her dynamic ideas and conversation. We, we, we don't need less, less than that. <laughs> Before going into, I will quickly recap the program's past fortnight. On the 17th of August, we have the talk, Enforcing to Reinforcing by Hyderabad City Police Commissioner, Sri Anjani Kumar. His speech was very insightful and threw a light on the working of police force and how 
Policing evolved over the years. He called for the participation of the citizens and invited the members to be a part of Hyderabad City Security Council. On the 21st August, we have an orientation on opportunities in the millet industry for women entrepreneurs. This talk was facilitated by IIMR, which is the authority in the field of millets and doing extensive research in the same. This talk definitely gave an idea to the women who are looking for opportunities in this industry. As a part of our outreach program on the 28th of August, Flow Hyderabad organized a, the second mega job drive at Usmania University PG College, Sikindrabad, in association with North Zone Police. 1,735 unemployed youth participated in this job mela, in which 27 companies offered jobs to 974 candidates. This initiative from our chapter got the attention and applaud from the national flow team. Happy to inform that this year, 100 new members have joined our chapter, and these members were <laughs> selected over six rounds of interviews. Today's talk, life and liberty, is a very deep subject. Women are making headlines each and every day as the makers and creators of positive change in all walks of life, be it as doctors, pilots, engineers, artists, dancers, journalists, or astronauts. They have been and are continuing to prove themselves. Let me stop there. I am not saying women are equal or better than men, because nothing is more alarming than the suggestion that women would eventually become just like men. Why do we have that comparison? Male and female, it is only a sex, not the way of life. Men and women should own the world as a mutual position. That is called liberty and nothing less than that. Let us see what Sagarika is going to say. Thank you so much. Now, I would request our esteemed speaker, Ms. Sagarika Ghosh, and chairperson Uma Chigrupati to come forward and grace the dais. I invite social media head, Ananda, to introduce our speaker for the day. I deem it my honor to present to you the brief profile of uh, the noted journalist, Ms. Sagarika Ghosh, who is also a personal hero of mine. Sagarika Ghosh is one of the India's most noted journalists, as well as, as an author and a broadcaster. She has worked in the Times of India, Outlook Magazine, and the Indian Express. She was a primetime television news anchor for the BBC World on Question Time India, as well as on the news network CNN IBN. She is the author of two novels, The Gin Drinkers and Blind Faith, as well as the recently published best-selling biography of Indira Gandhi, Indira, India's most powerful prime minister. Her most recent published work is the critically acclaimed treatise, Why Am I a Liberal? A Manifesto for Indians Who Believe in Individual Freedom. Sagarika Ghosh has won numerous awards in journalism, including C.H. Mohammed Koya National Journalism Award, as well as the Best Anchor Award from the Indian Television Industry Academy. She has also been listed as one of the world's most famous women road scholars. Ghosh is also a popular and well-read columnist and currently writes syndicated columns in the Times of India. Welcome. Our chairperson, Uma Chugrupati, will now fe felicitate our esteemed guest speaker, Ms. Sagarika Ghosh, with a Bidri Momento. Bidri Craft is one of the initiatives for the year. Yes, we have adopted a village Narayan Pet, and so Ms. Uma Chigrupati is presenting a sari to Ms. Sagarika Ghosh.
we have a special gift from ms sagarika ghosh for ms uma chigurupati to books i would now like to um, invite uh, uh, ms uma chigrupati to take the session forward with uh, ms sagarika ghosh each person life journey is like a lesson there is always some aspect to learn and to remember sagarika you went to oxford uh, studied history came back joined in times of india would like to uh, listen from you your life journey your ideas briefly can you cover thank you so much to uma and flo for inviting me here it's lovely to be here in hyderabad uh i just love this topic life and liberty because to me liberty is life and uh, life is best celebrated when we have liberty uh so I, my journey uh, began really when uh, i was a girl i was brought up in a very progressive bengali household uh my dadi was a very free spirited uh ex inquisitive eccentric old lady <laughs> i remember my dadi is you know looking for archaeological ruins and butterflies and uh, all kinds of natural life and history and she imbued in me a certain uh feeling that um you know that that the possibilities were boundless that there is splendor in the grass and wonder in the sand you know that everywhere you look can be extraordinary and everywhere you look can be magical and that you only have to see it right and you have to have that spirit of joy and adventure and uh, she was one of my early influences actually and my dadi was also a uh, freedom fighter she was a revolutionary in bengal and uh, from my early years i remember being brought up you know just as a person uh, never a girl or a boy but you know you were talking about gender i was always brought up to believe that i was just a person i didn't i actually didn't even know that there was such a thing as gender identity uh, i belonged to a large family i was a tomboy and i was always encouraged to do all the sort of so called boy things uh, it was only when i started working later in life that i discovered what it was to be a woman and to be slotted in that woman role in the workplace you know that's when i discovered oh there is gender identity and and all of that but before that i really wasn't conscious of this i uh, worked hard and uh, you know and and academic uh, rewards came my way and i went to oxford uh, oxford was an absolutely wonderful experience for me i think i went to oxford to discover india you know the saying is you go to the west to discover the east and you come to the east to discover the west so i certainly went to uh, the west and discovered the east because you know when you're away from your home you discover a whole new home you discover your identity you discover who you are what does it mean to be indian what does it mean to be a brown skinned indian woman uh, what does it mean to be an asian Uh, all of these categories which i was completely unaware of uh, growing up but in oxford they come up you come up sharply uh, you know they 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 hit you quite sharply and uh, so i think i plunged into a kind of discovery of india nehru style uh, you know and uh, i studied uh, indian history i studied modern indian history i studied uh, you know uh, the independence movement and then i uh, discovered somebody who has exercised a very seminal influence in my life and whose thought i have uh, read and studied in detail and who continues to inspire me because i think he's so misunderstood he's so well known but he's so misunderstood uh, which is mahatma gandhi you know if we look at the thought of mahatma gandhi if we look at the writings of mahatma gandhi beyond what we normally see he was the quintessential liberal the quintessential liberal because he believed in the power of the individual he believed in the power of individuality uh he believed in the transformed individual to change society you know uh so if you look at the gandhian satyagraha or the gandhian struggle it's a rule based disciplined 
form of action which is full of rules. You know, the Gandhian protest is not anarchy. You have to maintain hygiene, you have to be polite, you have to be non-violent, you have to have certain food habits, you have to have certain behavior codes. It's a very disciplined form of protest, which is protest because it is for truth. And truth is God. Gandhi interprets truth as God. When he interprets truth as God, he then forces the individual to become his best self or her best self. And it is the individual as her best self who can transform society. Gandhi opposes socialism because uh, he believes it destroys individual freedom. And you know, I've written a book on liberal values and a lot of people have said, oh, is this leftism? Actually, leftism is very far away from liberalism because the centralized socialist state takes away freedom. And it is, in fact, the liberal, you know, I hate to say this, and my leftist friends always uh, attack me on this, but it's actually the market economy that gives freedom to the individual. So uh, that's why when I say liberal, I mean uh, a civic, political, and a moral ideal by which the individual is you know, has greater freedom, and the state and the government has less control. And that was what Gandhi was all about. So he was the patron saint of liberalism, and which is why in Oxford I discovered him, and he has been my inspiration ever since. That's wonderful. Yeah. And after j coming back and joining, um, you started your journalism yes. career. So just talk about that. So I came back to India, and at that time, you know, in my generation, everybody was leaving India. All my friends were upping and going to the United States. Everybody was going to America. Nobody was coming back to India. But I was one of those who came back to India, and so did my husband, Rajdeep. And I think it's because the two of us and the whole Oxford gang came back to India together that we ended up talking on the phone and we ended up getting married. <laughs> but uh, but uh, so we, um, so both of us came back to India. And uh, I joined journalism because, you know, I was then steeped in the history of India and steeped in, you know, the national movement. And I had discovered so much about India and Oxford that I was full of India. And I wanted to uh, explore this through journalism. And I must say, you know, in my professional life, and today I see uh, the terrible instances of, uh, you know, sexual discrimination against women in the workplace and uh, the discrimination that is uh, against, you know, against uh, high achieving women. But I was fortunate to have very, very enlightened bosses. Uh, Mr. Dilip Patgaonkar was my first boss in the Times of India, who was a complete liberal and a, you know, voracious reader. And my second boss in Outlook magazine was Vinod Mehta, who was a complete eccentric and uh, terribly lovable. And uh, Vinod Mehta uh, gave me uh, a life lesson, which I'd like to share with you and which has stayed with me ever since. I was working all the while that I was married and had, was having my children. And uh, when I was in Outlook, I had my daughter, my second child, and Vinod Mehta told me that, you know, I'm sending you off on this assignment. And it was an assignment of the former British civil servants, you know, the, the British ICS officers who had served in India they were coming back to India and gathering at the Masuri Academy, the IAS Academy in Masuri. So he said, you go and cover them because, you know, they'll give you lots of, you've been to Oxford and, you know, you British, British, English, English. So I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you go and meet them and you talk to them and they will tell you these, uh, you know, stories about India. And I said, but, you know, I'm, I have got my little kid. My child was one and a half months old. And so he said, so what? Take your child. And so uh, I said, well, take my child and go on the assignment. He said, yes. So I said, how, how, will, I, how will you do it? And, and, and he, how will I do it? And he gave me this one line, which I, which I really remember. He said, you'll just have to manage. You'll just have to manage. You know, this, this uh, phrase has, uh, was, is a very simple phrase, but it, uh, really, it really encapsulates for me what we as women go through, that we just have to manage. You know, we do have all these tasks. We do have all these, uh, all these uh, responsibilities. But we just, it turned out that, you know, the fact that I had my child with me 
was a great hit with these British civil servants. And they were looking at me saying, oh, how wonderful. Is that a little baby? <laughs> and, uh, and there I was with my, with, you know, with my daughter. So it was, uh, it was a terrific experience for me. So I just think that you know, if we think out of the box as wives and mothers, as well as working women, uh, there's, there's nothing that should stop us. Because even if a situation is mad, or if a situation is unusual, or if a situation is a little crazy, that's fine. Because everything coalesces around it, and things fall into place. That's true. If yeah. you have the will, yeah, you will think out will. of the box, and you will reach. Yes. And then uh, you, you, can, you can chase the dreams and yes. you can reach, right? You can reach. And you know, if you're not afraid to uh, take a few risks, if you're not afraid to appear a little mad, <laughs> you know, uh, I've learned this lesson in professional life, be a little mad. You know, it helps. Because if you're, if you're five feet four and you know, you can get walked all over very easily, if you're mad, they can't walk all over you. You know, which is why, <laughs> Which is why I've often felt that, you know, the women politicians that are there, whether it's Mamta Banerjee or Jay Lalitha or uh, Mehbooba Mufti or Mayawati, you know, why are they, why are they so a little bit, you know, off? <laughs> it's because, it's because, you know, because if you're tiny and you're a woman and you're not at all scary, then the men, the men will just finish you off, you know, they'll devour you. But if you're crazy, they won't do it, you know? So, uh, so it's, it's the Kali avatar, you know? So I call it this kind of strategic insanity. And I used to deploy this strategic insanity in office all the time. Occasionally, go mad, you know? Go a little crazy. And then, you know, they, they step back and the men step back and, and you can get the job done, you know? So, so, uh, so I think if you're not afraid, if you're not afraid to come across as a little bit eccentric, and this I again learned from my dadi, who used to wear a cap, you know, at, at, at the age of 65 and go hunting for archaeological ruins in uh, Kolkata. And uh, I used to ask her that, you know, what are people, Dadi, what are you doing? I mean, you're going, he said, ah, it's okay, it's okay. And, you know, she would go off. And it was something that I learned from her, that it doesn't really matter uh, if you have the spirit, uh, it doesn't really matter what you do. So in that sense, you know, um, it, these, these were lessons that I learned through working. Often when you're leading a team of, uh, you know, men and women, it's always difficult to get respect from the men because they instantly have, you know, their backs are up because, uh, you know, what can she tell us? I mean, you know, she doesn't know anything. I mean, the women will listen and they're very diligent, but the men are difficult to, uh, to handle. And I think that at that point, uh, again, the lesson I learned in journalism was you know, this is, uh, this is again said, said very beautifully by the American uh, justice, uh, the justice of the Supreme Court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who said in every situation in life, it always, uh, it always helps to have hearing deficiency. You know, that certain things you just don't hear. You know, that you just didn't hear that. And uh, if you didn't hear it, it wasn't said. You know, so it, it didn't, it, you didn't hear it, your hearing aid slipped out, you just didn't hear it. And so, and this is the lesson that I give that, you know, just pretend, even if, this works very well with mothers-in-law, by the way. <laughs> very well with mothers-in-law. Just pretend you didn't hear. <laughs> you know, something is said, just tune out, you know? Because if you, if you react, if you react to it, and you react in anger, or you react in some emotional way, it's just an unnecessary situation. Whereas if you didn't even hear it, you don't even have to react, and the moment is gone. So, uh, you know, this was the other lesson I learned. Act a little crazy, develop hearing deficiency, <laughs> and also, you know, the third lesson I learned is, you know, in, in, in leadership roles or in, in a, office situation, it never helps to, to get angry or to, or to you know, yes. uh, have a, uh, you know, show your sure. anger. Yeah. Yes. But I think you need to persuade. Because you know, while we're looking at women leaders and you know, uh, addressing the glass ceiling and you know, shattering the glass ceiling, we still need to uh, persuade people. We need to make people understand that 
uh, yes, I have also passed exams. Yes, I have also uh, studied. Yes, I am also good at what I do. Yes, I also have a mind. Uh, but they need to be persuaded about all these things because it's not easy for them to think this, th th that this is the case with you. Um, so, you know, it it's makes sense to persuade rather than confront and, uh, you know, and get angry and say, you know, why aren't you listening to what I'm saying? But if you persuade, I think that always, that always helps. I think all of us can identify in whatever <laughs> she is saying, right? <laughs> Uh, for me, you know, I definitely agree. You have to be crazy in doing certain things. Yes. I, I think myself and my husband, I think whole of Hyderabad think that we are one crazy couple <laughs> going and running in middle of nowhere and uh, certain business decisions what we have taken and all. I think unless you are crazy, you can't do certain things. You have to be crazy. You yeah. really have to go to the edge and uh, come back. I was, you know, when I was, when I was, when you, I saw your name and I, I saw it and I, and I realized that this is not only the visionary entrepreneur, it's the marathon runner. <laughs> you know, I like her already. <laughs> and also one more thing, what I used to do 10 years back. Yeah. Uh, it's not about running or anything. You know, it, physical fitness gives a lot of confidence, mm. especially women. Yeah. You know, it if does. you are confident, I'm telling you, you can go and achieve anything. Yeah. That's the reason I had taken up for all, I think 15 years I worked in that. Mm -hmm. And also I used to say, when I can, I'm yes. in my late 40s, yes. when I can, why not you? Yes. I think as leaders, yes. every woman, when they are leading their, whatever it is, whether it is business or talking to the children also, when I can do that, why can't you? Yes. I think that's a great lesson. And you know, through physical act uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, li uh, activities and through sport, and of course, unlike you, I don't run the marathon, but I do do on the, I go on the treadmill. You <laughs> marathon running on the treadmill. <laughs> Next time, I'll think of Uma and run on the marathon, <laughs> run on the treadmill. Uh, is is you know is 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 uh, it it leads you to get used to making an effort. You know, I went to the Mahakumbh Mela in 2001. I tell this story often. This is another life lesson, life lesson for me. I went to cover the Mahakumbh in 2001. This is the Mahakumbh, you know, it yeah. happens next to the, um, uh, on the banks of the Sangam and it is a beautifully, it is a sort of spectacular festival. And I, you know, skeptic, rationalist, I was sent to cover this and I thought, oh gosh, this is not my cup of tea, Yaar, what is this Mahakumbh? Anyway, but I went there and I went to cover the Mahakumbh and uh, it was spectacular and breathtaking. And you know, the river and the, the sky and the sun, I mean, all of these elemental sort of, uh, you know, uh, kind of presences are there. And, uh, and I experienced again some, uh, you know, a kind of uh, a, 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 a sort of epiphany. And along the banks of the Sangam, you have these pravachans, you know, those pravachans given by sadhus. So I was wandering, uh, wandering along, the one of, uh, along the Sangam and I l s happened to sit in on one pravachan given by one sadhu and I didn't think it was any going to be anything very major. I thought, you know, let me listen to this. But he said something very interesting. He was saying something very interesting. Um, he was saying that there are three kinds of happiness. Uh, the first kind of happiness is the ha happiness of, you know, doing something wonderful, going to a movie, going to a meal, going to a lovely party, where you go and you think, you know, this is wonderful, but it's going to end. It'll come to an end sometime. It's, it's fleeting, it's momentary. The second kind of happiness is the happiness of um, doing a job, ki mein, uh, mein job kar rahi hoon, mein ja rahi hoon, mein office mein baithti hoon. And he, he was, you know, and he, was, he saw me there, and he, you know, with my camera, and so he was addressing me, ki mein job karti hoon, mein patrakar hoon. And, you know, every day you have a routine of going to a place of work, and you're doing your job, and you're doing it uh, to the best of your ability, and that's a certain form of happiness. But there's a third kind of happiness, the last form of happiness, which is koshish, effort. You know, the swimmer who can't swim anymore but keeps pushing himself for the last lap. The mountaineer who can't climb yes. but keeps pushing, us, uh, pushing forward. You feel weighed down by worries, by stresses, by anxieties, but you still wake up in the morning, you still go through your day. So the koshish, the effort, endeavor, you know, the 
जो जो आनंद कोशिश से मिलता है यू नो दैट इज द a different form of anand you know a different form of happiness and he sort of mentioned the examples of nelson mandela and mother teresa and he said this superhuman effort this it's effort you know it's it's endeavor and that is what brings you uh, happiness at the end of the day and this again has has you know has been one of my one of my mantras that uh, if you do make that effort and you find yourself pushing yourself to make an effort and whatever the circumstances it doesn't have to be climbing a mountain or being on the treadmill or trying to be like uma or you know but uh, but it 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 can it could be anything uh, just just you know if you feel you're in a situation but you want you get out of it through self help uh, then that again is 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 uh, is deeply uh, is, is deeply joyful Yeah, Kumbh Mela is a yeah. great experience. It's a great experience. I think and, uh, most of the people. I don't know. Have anybody? Draw. Has anybody been? You've been? Yeah. Has gone. Who's, who <laughs> spent the night on the sang on the sangam? You have, because you see the thing is they seal it off before the shahi snan. They seal it off. So if you want to cover the, I was going to uh, doing it as a reporter. So if you want to cover the shahi snan of the sadhus, you have to spend the night there. Mm -hmm. so i was spending the night there with uh, on you know in my sleeping bag with my camera crew and uh, you know it was the most incredible experience and you know as i said you know me skeptic rationalist not a really deeply religious person at all uh, you know you wake up at 4 in the morning and this was the most incredible experience and i i was so moved by this that i actually wrote a whole book about it you know uh, that it you wake up at 4 in the morning i don't know if you had this experience uh, and there is a huge crowd on the banks of the sangam huge multitudes you know a, a multitudinous crowd and you wake up at 4 in the morning and there is just pin drop silence in this huge crowd and all you see is this dazzling sky because the sky is full of stars and the river and the silent multitude you know and 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 really for me it was like the presence of of brahma you know it was like uh, a a moment where there is sky there is river and there is a massed humanity which is completely quiet and it was the most surreal experience and i was turning around to my camera crew saying photo le le jaldi and they said but madam kya lena because there's nothing to there's, it's not as if you can capture it you just have to feel it you know it's it's something that you that you feel which is um uh you know which is which is perhaps that it's the moment or is it the is it the atmosphere created by the human beings is it the river is it the because it's not as if there's any priests or chanting or anything it's just silent and uh it, it was it was the most uh you know it was the most moving experience for me and uh so i i actually put my experiences down in a, in a novel after that coming to the books i would yes. like to ask there are lot of uh, autobiographies uh, you know written about indira gandhi yeah you also wrote in what way is yours different from others gosh there's not a whole lot new you can say about indira gandhi <laughs> well you know i wrote the book because i was commissioned to do it in uh, 2017 because she was born in 1917 so it was 100 years of indira gandhi so i was commissioned to do a biography of her and uh, i i had a wonderful time doing it i i focused more on indira uh, the person you know the sort of trying to take out her inner feelings and her emotions and you know what she uh, what she felt i discovered a very difficult politician but a very attractive human being you know a, a very seductive woman although a, a many, in many ways a quite a dreadful politician so i had to kind of you know marry this quite a <laughs> you know let's not go there yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, so but but you know but as a person she's um, she was she's very she very multi layered very attractive person uh, and uh, and that's what i i i kind of uh, brought out in the book 
and I'm working on another prime minister now. So I've, I, I'm doing three prime ministers uh, in Dira, then there's another one and another one. Oh. <laughs> we are looking forward and let me go through the book. Uh, when it comes to women leaders, I'm just thinking, you know, earlier we have Sidimavo, Bandar Naike, yeah. of course, Indira Gandhi, uh, Hasina, mm -hmm. um, all these people. Now, when we look now, Khalida is also there. Now, yeah. I think Hasina is... Uh, uh, Hasina is still there. Still there. Yeah. But Benazir Bhutto, you yeah. know, so yeah. many people yeah. at the top. But if you see, how come, you know, compared to earlier, the number of uh, women leaders are coming down? Don't you think so? I think so. Well, we have Mamata Banerjee, Didi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of women are active in, you know, coming up, I think, at the grassroots level, but very few are reaching the top in that sense. I mean, Indira Gandhi, I have to say, uh, reached where she did because of her family. Yes. Uh, yes. And you know, because of her father, yes. I, I don't think if she ha if she hadn't been Jawaharlal Nehru's daughter, yeah. I don't think she, she would have uh, risen to the top of politics. That's she may have been a political activist. Uh, but I don't think she would have become prime minister had she not been uh, Nehru's daughter. So in that sense, this is what I establish in my book, that uh, her success was not that much about women as it was much about, much more about family and, and her, you know, her lineage. Uh, but it was very interesting. You know, I don't think Nehru himself thought of her as his successor. I think he thought of her as, you know, a very worthy uh, political activist. There are lots of letters where he says, Indu is very good at interior decoration, and she, you know, she, she is very good at uh, certain things. I don't think he ever thought she would succeed him as prime minister. You know, I don't think she, he would have, he thought that. That was what I discovered. But the party worked in a certain way that she was made the prime minister because she was Nehru's daughter. So in that sense, she, but a lot of, you know, Mamta Banerjee, I think is very interesting. She is uh, very self-made. She's come up entirely on her own. Uh, you know, so has to some extent Mayawati, Jayalalita. I mean, these are, these are there. And I think a lot of women uh, leaders are there, but it's very difficult to climb the political glass ceiling. The glass ceiling is still very much there, very much there. You know, uh, in journalism, in uh, politics, uh, it's very much there. I mean, how many women do you see who are anchoring the 9 p.m. news? Just, I mean, okay, maybe a few, maybe one. 9 p.m. news is all anchored by men. Uh, the editor-in-chief of an of a organization will always be a man. Uh, the head of a... You know, generally speaking, the head of a corporate house or the head of a financial firm will always be a man. You can get women achievers who will rise right up to the second level or maybe even right up to the top, but there invariably may be a man above her. You know, so uh, it, it's still very difficult in India uh, for women to, uh, you know, for, to go beyond a point. In journalism, for example, you can go up to, say, senior editor or even executive editor, but if you want to go to editor-in-chief, you see the man at the top is the one with the connections with other powerful men in other sectors. He's got the connections in politics, in business, in finance, in society, who are all men. So he's slotted into the male networks that already exist. You as a woman can't slot in there. I discovered this very early on in my career as a political journalist. You know, I as a woman political journalist, I can't sit in Lalu Prasad Yadav's home at late at night. I, I can't, I mean, it would be hi highly misunderstood. Yes. Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> really. But, uh, you know, but, uh, but the way the men can, you know, and the way the, the, the men are able to do. So, in that sense, uh, you know, there are, there are invisible hurdles everywhere. Uh, the men after work will go to the press club and have their drinks and share their, share their informal networks. And that's just, just, it's not just fun for the boys. It's actually a time when a lot of deals are done. A lot of associations are made. A lot of networks are formed. You are out of that network because you have to finish your work and go home to the kids. So you can't go, you know, hanging around with the boys late at night when a lot of the work is getting done. You know, so um, this is a, 
uh, this is again a hazard of uh, of uh, of of uh, of uh, uh, you know of the glass ceiling. I call these the invisible obstacles because you don't see them, and you think they're not there, but they're all there. They're there in very invisible ways which you can't crack, uh, and. Uh, uh, which uh, you know, which wi which women find difficult to enter. You know, this uh, Sheryl Sandberg had that famous book, Lean In. You know, it's so true. You know, at meetings, we women tend to lean back. We 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 take the back seat. We don't say anything. Whereas it's the men who will sit there and who will give their view and give their gyan and you know, and they will dominate the meeting. Whereas we tend to hold back. So in that sense, it's it's still difficult for very assertive women to. Uh, to find it easy to, to climb the ladder. It's difficult. So that's what I say, you know, when we spoke about the women Olympians, for example, who do very well in, who are doing very well in, uh, who did extremely well in Tokyo, or, you know, women's, you know, the women sports persons, Olympians, uh, women astronauts, as you said. But, you know, unless we change mindsets, unless we change the way people think, I don't think there's going to be progress. You know, Mahatma Gandhi said, those who obstruct the rise of free independent women obstruct the rise of free independent men. You know, if we want to have free independent women, we must also create free independent men. It's together. We must, we must proceed together in the journey of freedom and independence. Yes. But as long as we remain, you know, what I call a sun-worshipping culture, S-O-N, sun. We are S-U-N, sun, and S-O-N, sun. Both of these we are worshipping. So as long as we remain this sun-worshipping and son-worshipping culture, we will, you know, this mindset will not change. And uh, so unless the mindset change, you know, we then, you know, we, we can't make it, uh, make it possible for women to, uh, to really truly uh, make their mark as professionals. You know, in fact, we're talking about women working. I'm actually uh, you know, shocked to see that from 2015 to now, there's been a huge drop in women yes. participation in the workplace. Yes. It's dropped from 35% yes. to 16%. Yes. And the pandemic has hit women the most. most. Women are the ones who are, who, are, who are being done out of jobs, who are having to stay at home with additional burdens That's of housework. Right, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and a third of women, this study showed recently, are not even seeking work. And there is a resurgence of kind of neo-traditional mindsets, you know, in a way. And I think this is worrying. Why are women dropping out of the workplace? You know, why are women voluntarily not, uh, not working? And, and I would say this is, uh, this is a real step back, because if you're educated, why are you wasting your education? Do something. I know that uh, perhaps even if you don't get opportunities in the formal workplace, there is need to make the most of your education, not waste your education, not waste the fact that you are able to do something that so many millions of women cannot do. So uh, in that sense, it's a real shame that women are dropping out of the workplace. This is becoming you know, what, is, what, the, what magazines are calling India's missing women. Our workface, workforce is lacking women. And this is terrible for gender justice, it's terrible for gender equity, it's terrible for gender justice in society as a whole. If women go missing from the workplace, uh, we are going to find it extremely difficult to establish um, male-female gender parity in other walks of life aside from the professional world, you know? I totally agree with yeah. that. It's it's a very alarming it's situation. It's very alarming. It is in fact alarming. Yeah. So come back to your books and uh, your interviews. Uh, you must have interviewed very, very impressive and very high profile uh, women. Who's impressed you most? Can you think of someone? <laughs> Uh, I think the person who's impressed me most is probably Ila Ben Bhatt. Uh, uh, she is, I don't know, if you, you must have heard of Seva. And uh, she, is, uh, she is the founder of Seva. And uh, Ila Bhatt is someone who uh, believes profoundly like Gandhi in the power of the individual and the power of the individual woman to affect change wherever she is. And she's free from doctrine, uh, free from any kind of doctrine or ideology. She just works on the ground with individuals. 
And what she has achieved has been truly remarkable. Seva is a uh, path-blazing uh, uh, entity of uh, women. It's a cooperative of women's, uh, a, a, a micro cooperative of women's wo of working women. And uh, it was incredibly impressive to meet her and to see the kind of radiance and energy that, that comes out of her. Uh, was in fact uh, truly memorable for me. Uh, the other memorable interview that I had was with Mamta Banerjee. Uh, I don't know if any, any, any of you have seen that viral video clip where she storms out of, the, out of a show that I was recording. So it was, it was incredible because we were recording this show and she was very sweet, sweet and she was interacting with people and she was very jokey and very happy and you know, everybody was talking to her and so, suddenly a, a young girl stood up and asked her a question about crimes against women. At which point she lost it completely, flung off her mic, took out her earpiece and stormed out of the show before I even realized what happened. And uh, you know, <laughs> and then it struck me that again, this was you know, one a moment of uh, uh, strategic insanity, <laughs> and it was a moment of madness. And uh, uh, so uh, you know, it, it was it was quite a memorable moment for me because I realized that politicians can really go from you know one extreme to the other in a flash of an eye, uh, and it was uh, a very uh, it was a very um, interesting time, but Mayawati is also interesting. Uh, Mayawati uh, is extremely imperious. She's a very imperious, you know, leader. And uh, she, I was once accompanying her on the campaign trail in UP, and she was ordering all her bureaucrats around saying, idhar aa, udhar ja, bed ja, khada ho ja. And you could see these, you know, these six feet tall bureaucrats <laughs> all going, yes, madam, yes, madam. And, um, and then she would always come down from the stage and her changing room or the place where, where, she, place where she refreshed herself was called Swiss Cottage. You know, so <laughs> like a sw chalet in Switzerland or something. <laughs> and, uh, so in the middle of burning UP, you know, she would come off the stage at, you know, at Bareilly or something, and there would be the Swiss cottage. And she would go to the Swiss cottage and freshen up and go to the stage, and the stage would be ringed around with these gigantic air conditioners, you know, which would be pumping cold air onto the stage. And um, she would be, you know, beautifully dressed in her salwar kameez while the sweating crowd is, you know, perspiring in 42 degrees heat. But here is Madam with her, with her air conditioners giving her speech. And then, uh, then she, uh, you know, she would come off the stage and she would give into, she spoke to me at length about her journey and about the, you know, movement of Bahujan Samaj and, you know, the people's, you know, the people's rights and the, rights of the Bahujan, but in the middle of talking about rights of Bahujan and, you know, the struggle of the Bahujan, she would say, Udhar ja, idhar ja, bed ja, tu kya kar raha hai, Coca-Cola leke ya. You know, and that would be, and it would be, and I would, I would, uh, you know, be really flummoxed. And it was, you know, very interesting because we were going from place to place. We were going from, um, I think we were going from, uh, uh, Allahabad to uh, some other place outside, outside, and then another place. And we, uh, we were going on her chopper, and uh, she was she was campaigning, and she would turn to this very tall and imposing UP bureaucrat, you know, who was this very impressive-looking gentleman, and in a suit, you know, in that heat, in a suit and tie, and you know, and she would call him by his name. I'm not taking his name <laughs> because I know the camera's on, but he's still there in UP, and she would say, "Idhar aa, madam ko bathroom leke ja." And you know, to pointing to me, and I would say, "But, but I don't want to go to the bathroom. It's, it's okay. It's okay." And she would say, "No, no, go." And there would be again, you know, the Swiss cottage, which were, which was where the facilities were, and so I'd have to go there, and he would be standing outside, and I would go there, and then we would go to the next venue, and she would say, "Hey." Madam go leke ja. And I would be like, but I really don't want to go. I really don't want to go. If I need to go, I'll have to drink more Coca-Cola or something because I really don't need to go anymore. But she would say, no, no, and, and you know, take her, 
उसको ले जा एंड दिस पो वेरी डिस्टिंग्विश आई ए एस ऑफिसर यू नो इन इज सूट एंड टाई इन द मिडल ऑफ द यू पी हीट वॉज फोर्स टू डू ऑल ऑफ दिस एंड आई जस्ट थॉट माई गॉड दिस इज दिस इज द पावर ऑफ ऑफ हर यू नो शी वॉज ट्राइंग टू डेमोन्स्ट्रेट हर पावर एंड एंड as as the as a woman belonging to the bahujan samaj and as a woman belonging to uh, the you know the uh, communities that she was representing for her to order around and a senior distinguished ias officer who was literally dancing attendance on her is a huge thing you know i saw it as kind of embarrassing and deeply cringe worthy but to her it was um a flourish of power and to her supporters uh, it was a it was a sort of you know it was a sign that this revolution had arrived and the revolution had um had uh, in some ways uh you know uh, had 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 scored a success by doing this you know so it was a it was a sort of flourish of power and that i found very uh, very interesting yeah politics is a very difficult yes, uh, field yes it is it is unless it's, uh, it's very it's very it's very it's very it's very interesting but you know politicians are very very interesting all of them because they are all very um multi layered you know and i feel that today in our pol politicized environment it's so acrimonious you know this side versus that side and you know if you're this then you're that if you're not this you're that whereas actually we are all very layered and we're all very complicated and we're all you know we have there are so many different shades to all of us and so there are so many different shades to politicians there are many different shades to indira gandhi Uh, there are many different shades to the uh, to the prime minister i'm working on now uh, he is perceived in one way but he had so many complexities and so many layers that um, it's unfortunate that that past heroes are getting caught in this tutu meme whereas in fact they are very rich as human beings you know they're 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 richly layered as all of us are and uh, and that that's always is that's always interesting to explore i think one has to have the craziness yes <laughs> to withstand in the world right yes uh, actually i wanted you of the audience to ask their questions can i i just want to before we run this question the creation is good you are five seven yes even if you're five seven I <laughs> See, I guess you were five seven. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It, you know, but the thing is, you instantly get not taken seriously. You know, you're there in the corner. You're in a sari or a salwar kameez. So then, if you to assert yourself, the craziness is important. It starts as a drama. Yes, yes, yes. It does. It does. And uh, and I think it's quite a good thing. <laughs> so, anyone from the front row? Would 